Uh, good afternoon. We're sorry for this slight delay uh, in starting the lecture. We generally like to uh, do things on time, but uh, given the uh, volume of traffic that seems to have uh, uh, masked the roads outside, we're starting five minutes late. But uh, welcome to the uh, 2012 Mahesh Chandra Regmi Lecture. I'm Deepak Thapa of Social Science Baha, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this 10th the series of this lectures, uh, excuse me, in the series of lectures. <coughs> it was back in 2003 uh, that some of us, with some amount of hesitation, and, so, and also a great deal of expectation, had gone to meet Mahesh Chandra Regmi at his place, not far from here to ask his permission to establish a lecture in his name. I guess I do not have to explain to this audience why we thought it was necessary to have a lecture in his name. But knowing how he shunned any kind of publicity, we were not sure whether he would agree to it or not. Although I had met him personally only a few times prior to that, it was gratifying to know that after the initial but natural reluctance, uh, Mr. Regmi gave his consent for this lecture series and even agreed to be, present, <coughs> excuse me, to be present when we kicked it off. The late Harka Gurung instantly co consented to be the one to deliver the first of the lecture series in April 2003. And it is a tug in my heart uh, that I remember how Dr. Gurung went down to uh, uh, Mr. Regmi, who was seated in his wheelchair and the aisle of the International Convention Center to greet him after the lecture was over. Mr. Regmi's image that you see in the backdrop is taken from that day, and as he told me, uh, he was wearing the same shirt that he wore to receive the Maxis Award in 1977. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Regmi passed away a few months later. It is with great satisfaction that we can recall the host of luminaries who followed Dr. Guru in the years since. And on behalf of Social Science Baha, I would like to thank all of them for making it possible to continue this series for, long, for so long. In the same spirit, I would like to welcome Professor André Bethe, who will speak on the theme, The Varieties of Democracy. I personally think that it is a most apt topic for today, coming as it does on the day that the world's most widely followed democratic exercise has come to a close, and an old democracy has renewed its commitment to the people. I now invite Rajendra Pradhan of Sciences and Humanities, and formerly chair of the Social Science Baha, to introduce uh, Professor Bethe. But before that, can I ask you all to undertake what has become a modern day ritual, which is to take out your phone and either turn it off or uh, put it on silent mode. Thank you, Dr. Padan. Once again, welcome to today's lecture. And I would especially like to extend a very warm welcome to <coughs> Professor Andre Bete, who will de deliver today's lecture on the varieties of democracy. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation to deliver this year's lecture. Uh, Deepak has already told you about the, you know, the beginning of the, the, the lectures. Uh, let me just mention, I think, the eight or nine people who delivered the lecture after Harkabhadra Gurung, and they are you know, the distinguished scholars. Kumar Pradhan in 2004, Hira Tofa, Michael Opitz, Ashish Nandi 2007, David Ludden, Romila Tapper, Eleanor Ostrom, and James Fisher. Today's is the 10th lecture. Uh, and these lectures can be downloaded from the BAS website. And I think Deepak is, just, uh, is going to announce that all the lectures will be published in a book form you know, within a year. So the 10 lectures will be published in a book form. Uh, it is a great honor and pleasure and privilege for me to introduce Professor Andre Petey, who was my teacher when I was a student many, many decades ago at the Department of Sociology, University of Delhi. Professor Betty of mixed French and Bengali parentage was born and brought up in Bengal, in fact, in Calcutta. I think. After completing his master's in anthropology from the University of Calcutta, he received his doctorate in sociology 
under the supervision of Professor Amin Srinivas from the University of Delhi. Professor Bete has spent over 40 years <coughs> at the Department of Sociology, that is from 1959 to 1999 when he retired, but is still affiliated with the department as Professor Emeritus since 2002. In his very long and very, very distinguished career, he has also taught at the University of Oxford, Cambridge University, the University of Chicago, and the London School of Economics. He has held a number of very distinguished academic appointments in India and abroad, including, to name a few, uh, National Research Professor in India, 2006, Simon Fellow at the University of Manchester, the Tim Bergen Chair at the Erasmus University, Rotterdam, visiting professor at the London School of Economics, distinguished lecturer, visiting lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley, and fellow at the, at the Institute of Advanced Study, Berlin. He's in a very wide across the spectrum. And he has delivered many, many important lectures in India and abroad. There are too many to name them. He's also a fellow of the British Academy and an honorary fellow at the Royal Anthropological Institute. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in addition to these appointments, he has served with great distinction as board member or trustee of many educational and research institutions, and especially for three years as the chairman of the Indian Council of Social Science Research, Social Science. Indian Council of Social Science Research. He is also a member of the National Knowledge Commission, but resigned over a proposal to increase caste-based reservation. The government of India awarded him the Padma Bhushan in 2005 for his contributions in the field of sociology. So as, it, as is apparent by now, Professor Bette is one of India's leading, and perhaps the most influential sociologist. This is because he has not only published numerous and some very well received books and scholarly articles, he has also contributed regularly to Indian newspapers, writing lucidly and cogently about many issues that he felt strongly about. The historian Ram Sandra Goa observed that, and I quote, Professor Bete has written insightfully about all the major questions of the day, India's encounter with the West, the contest between religion and secularism, the relationship between caste and class, the links between poverty and inequality, the nurturing of public institutions, and the role and responsibilities of intellectuals. Close quote. He has published a collection of scholarly articles in his book, Anti-Utopia, Essential Writings of Andre Bete, and two collections of his newspaper articles in Chronicles of Our Time and Ideology and Social Science. He is thus well known not only as an, as an academician, but also as a public intellectual, though he may not see himself in that, this term, I think. And, and uh, the books are, I think, most of the books are available with Mandala Bookstore, I think, so with that. Professor Bete is perhaps best known worldwide for his contribution to the comparative study of social inequality. Indeed, most of his earlier publications are about caste, social stratification, and inequality. To name but a few, caste, class, and power. Changing patterns of stratification in a Tanzur village, 1965, this was based on his PhD uh, the thesis. Social inequality, selected readings, published by Penguin, and is a reader that was widely read by students in the 70s and you know, 80s, I think. Uh, inequality and social change, 
studies in agrarian social structure, the idea of natural inequality and other essays, the backward classes in contemporary India and Marxism and class analysis is 2008. He has also published on the relations between sociology and social anthropology, including six essays in comparative sociology, which I think is read by many students in Nepal, and sociology essays on approach and method 2002. Most recently, he has published several books on ideas, institutions, and ideologies, most not notably, Antimonies of Society, Essays on Ideologies and Institutions, 2000, Universities at the Crossroads, 2010, and a just published book, Democracy and its Institution, its Institutions. Sorry. Professor Bette's contributions to sociology are not limited to research and publications, but include, to my mind, equally importantly, his teaching. As he wrote in one of his essays, I have, I quote, I have in my career always put teaching ahead of research. Close quotes. I think it's worth noting <coughs> that Professor Bette chose to teach in India when he could easily have worked abroad. Consequently, hundreds and hundreds of students, Indian students, and many foreign students, including me, have benefited immensely from his commitment to teaching, thereby contributing enormously to the development of sociology in India and elsewhere. On a more personal note, what I recall from my days at the Delhi School of Economics many, many decades ago is that Professor Bette was very demanding of her students, as he always has been of himself. He was an excellent teacher with a very clear expository style that helped us understand the theories he taught us, as will be seen in today's lecture. Perhaps the most important lesson he taught us and surely this is the hallmark of great teachers, is that we should not blindly accept, but instead question with reason and confidence and backed by evidence, the theories and systems of knowledge that are considered canonical. If I were to characterize Professor Bete's work, the phrase I would use is against the grain. Right from his first book, where, if I remember correctly, he used Weberian analysis to understand the relations between caste, class, and power at a time when class, caste was a dominant uh, focus of study, to his attempt to unite disciplines of sociology and social anthropology, or his controversial firm stand against increasing caste-based reservations, or his critique of Indian intellectuals. He has gone against the grain, eschewing popular views and received wisdom to put forward his own well-reasoned arguments as clearly and moderately as possible. I could go on, but Professor Bete would surely agree with Mr. Rekmi, who once said, I said during this entire first inaugural lecture, do not praise me too much for it will get, go into my head. So he was very modest about that. Having said all this, I'm sure that you'll enjoy listening to today's lecture on the varieties of democracy from a comparative perspective, but focusing on Indian models of democracy. And I shall not you know, be so clear that I shall not have to summarize this. But at a time when Nepal is going through a period of chaotic transition, for us permanent, Professor Betty's lecture will provoke us to think a bit more deeply about democracy in general, as well as the institutions and forms of democracy that may be suitable to Nepal. 
as is the custom in this lecture series, we'll not have any question answer session after the lecture. However, you're welcome to meet Professor Betty during high tea to discuss questions you may have. But please collect your copy of the lecture uh, on the way out after the program. I would not like to invite Professor Betty to deliver his lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Rajendra. You were my student many, many years ago, and I find that you still remember the time you spent in the Delhi School of Economics. It was a great time in the life of the Delhi School. This was in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, uh, we used to then uh, discuss and talk about subjects which were very controversial. I found that students in the Jawaharlal Nehru University, as well as students in the Delhi School of Economics, the brighter ones among them, were drawn like a magnet to Marxism. And I thought that this needs to be examined critically. So when I came back to Delhi after a year's absence in Cambridge, I decided that I would give a course on aspects of 20th century Marxism in which I would put under critical scrutiny the basic premises of Marxism. So uh, that's what I did and on the first day when I met the class, it was an MPhil class and a very good MPhil class. There were eight students, all very bright, and I came in and gave them a pep talk and told them what I was going to do and what I expected from them. And then after I'd finished, as an afterthought, I turned to the students and I said, do you have any questions to ask of me? And Mr. Pradhan, <laughs> after some hesitation, got up and said, we all know that you are hostile to Marxism. Why have you decided <laughs> to give a course on Marxism? I think at that time, he was less hostile to Marxism than I was. It's not that I was hostile to Marxism, but I thought that like any intellectual system, it needs to be examined critically, rather than uh, with uh, blind admiration or adulation. So I was reminded of that and of the time we spent in the Delhi School of Economics, which is one of the liveliest places, still is one of the liveliest places for social science teaching and research anywhere in the world. And many people have asked me this question as to why I stayed on in the Delhi School of Economics instead of going overseas to seek my, seek my fortunes in Britain or America, as many of my very distinguished colleagues in the Department of Economics had done. Ours was a very good department, the Department of Sociology, but it didn't have the kind of stars that the Department of Economics, which was a larger department, had attracted. Among those stars, one is a Nobel laureate, Professor Sen, Amartya Sen. Another is the Prime Minister of India today. And they, they, they were puzzled, they were curious to know why I stayed behind. And the answers were usually of two kinds. Those answers, which were unkind to me, suggested that I didn't go because nobody asked me from abroad. And the other answer, which was kind to me, was that I didn't go because I wanted to build the Indian nation. Neither answer is correct. I didn't go because I liked the place. I liked the Delhi School of Economics and I liked teaching there and I still like to go back there as often as I can. And it is in that atmosphere that I developed my arguments about institutions, I wrote a book some uh, four or five years ago on universities as institutions and I talked about the different kinds of institutions of society. And then I thought that I would address myself to the specifically political institutions. 
So I wrote a book called Democracy and Its Institutions in which I focused attention not so much on the ideals and values of democracy. People write a great deal about the ideals, the values, the aspirations of democracy. But I think that if you are to understand how democracy actually works, then you have to focus your attention on the institutions of democracy because it is through that that you see how widely democratic practice departs from democratic ideals. If you remain focused only on ideals, you can talk until the cows come home. But it's only when you try to understand how parliament works, how the Supreme Court works, how political parties work, that you really get to know what the real contradictions of the world are. And that's why I decided to write a book, and uh, I found it displaced there, displayed there called Democracy and Its Institution. I'm just trying to explain to you what led me to the selection of the topic on which I have decided to speak today. Now, one of, the, one of the running themes of that book, Democracy and Its Institutions, is a contrast that I make between constitutional democracy and populist democracy. I think that 60 years after independence, at least in India, 60 years after independence, I think that, uh, that uh, the, the, the record shows that democracy has made a place for itself in India. The question is not whether democracy will survive in India or not survive in India. I'm pretty sure that it will survive in India, uh, in, at least in, in, in my lifetime. I don't see it being replaced by something else. The question is not that, whether democracy will survive or not survive. The question is what kind of democracy, what kind of democracy. And I have been trying to argue that over the last 60 years or so, we have moved away, at least in India, from what I call constitutional democracy. When we started, we started with constitutional democracy. I think Nehru and Ambedkar, who were very important in the early stages of the foundation of the Indian democracy, they were both strong constitutionalists. They both believed that if democracy is to survive in India, then we have to focus our attention on constitutional democracy, on the constitution and the laws and the procedures and the rules. Gradually, gradually, we have moved towards a more populist form of democracy. And I think that democracy as such rests on a tension between two different principles. And each nation has to work out its own solution as to how this tension is to be resolved. These two different principles are what I call the rule of law, that is a constitutional principle, and the rule of numbers. And I think that in India, the rule of numbers tends often to overwhelm the rule of law. But again, I believe that the constitution is not going to be discarded in, in, in India. It will be amended, it will be modified, it has already been amended more than a hundred times, which is much more than has happened in the whole history of the United States or France. But I think it will be amended. I think people will uh, move away from what is required by the Constitution, but they will not be prepared to give it up or to abandon it. So my, my sense is that when we talk about democracy, when we talk about democracy, I have come to believe, you know, uh, several of my, my friends and colleagues pointed out that yes, it's all very true that I make a contrast between constitutional democracy and populist democracy and that I pretend to be objective, detached, value neutral. But if one reads between the lines in my writings, they will find that my bias, I have a bias towards constitutional democracy rather than populist democracy. This may or may not be true. Every scholar, every thinking man has some bias. He tries as hard as he can to restrict that bias, but it's not possible for any human being to eliminate every bias that he has. At least he should be conscious of his biases and try to limit them, to regulate them, and to warn his readers about what his own biases and preferences are. So I now feel that this whole business of uh, the 
primacy of constitutional democracy with which we started in 1947, 1950. Both these years are very important in the history of Indi India because 1947 was the year in which India became independent and 1950 was the year in which we adopted our republic, republican constitution. Uh, at that time, I think that there was uh, a, a, a strong, certainly Dr. Ambedkar, who was the maker of the Constitution of India, was a very, very strong constitutionalist. And he warned, he warned uh, the nation that uh, we have, we have uh, achieved independence at a great cost. We have written a constitution which is very important. And we should now not take recourse to demonstrations, rallies, dharnas, and so on, which, in his words, invited what he called the grammar of anarchy. He said we should not take recourse to that. And he said that if there had been some justification for these modes of protest, extra-constitutional modes of protest in the past, this may have been because we had no other recourse. We were under colonial rule. And this is the only way in which, only effective way in which we could register our unhappiness with the way in which the regime was uh, run. And, you know, I think, I think that it is obvious that uh, Dr. Ambedkar's view of democracy was very different from Mahatma Gandhi's view of it. In my judgment, Mahatma Gandhi was from beginning to end uh, a populist at heart, a populist and a communitarian at heart. For him, democracy meant what the people and the community decided here and now, rather than going back to the rules, looking at the rules, going by the rules, and amending the rules as and when necessary. So this is uh, roughly uh, uh, the context in which I, des I, 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 I sort of asked myself, was my bias towards constitutional democracy and my uh, aversion, if I may use a strong word, to populist democracy really justified. Is there only one form of democracy? Is there only one form of democracy? And I think that when one asks this question, one goes to the very root of democracy. And this is what I want to discuss with you today. I think that what is essential to democracy, and this is the argument that I will develop uh, as I go along, is the nature of the opposition and the manner in which opposition is organized in a democracy. I think, I think that what is unique to democracy, what is unique to democracy, is not that there is opposition in a democracy. There is opposition in all political systems. But in democracy, opposition is considered legitimate. This is not true of all political systems. If you look at China today, or if you look at the Soviet Union in the past, it's not that there was no opposition there. But that opposition was not considered legitimate. That opposition was driven underground, or it became diffused until it exploded. You, we, we, we get... Uh, examples of this over and over again. When you delegitimize opposition, then you drive it underground and it simmers, the discontent simmers, and then it explodes at a certain point of time. So I think that this is a great innovation that democracy has introduced in our political life. I think this is the great, le and it provides a great learning experience. Because once you accept the legitimacy of opposition, then you recognize the fact that many questions are open, that democracy is a continuing process and essentially it is a learning process. People who operate the democratic system should be able to learn from the experiences that they have and from the experiences of others. And I think that democracy, by being skeptical of the perfection of any given political regime, or being skeptical even about the perfectibility of any political re regime keeps the mind open all the time as to possible way of improving things. 
improving things incrementally instead of just throwing everything aside and moving towards a kind of utopia which will itself in course of time generates its own resentment, its own opposition, its own hostility. So I think that the, that the role of the opposition is of very great importance in, in, a, in a democracy. Now, I have mentioned that uh, opposition is present in all societies, even in peasant societies, pre-industrial societies. Opposition simmered underground and it burst forth from time to time in acts of looting, vandalism and so on, long before uh, modern democracies came into being. And even in so-called totalitarian regimes in our present time, there is always opposition. The question is, how is this opposition organized? And I think that the party system, the party system has played a very important part in giving focus to the opposition and in organizing it and legitimizing it. Uh, but I'm today not very sure that the party system is the only way of organizing the relationship between those who are in authority and those who are in opposition. Are there other ways of doing it? In addition, I still believe that the party system plays an extremely important part in giving focus to opposition, in giving it legitimacy, particularly in forms of parliamentary uh, democracy. It, 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 it is very important because it gives uh, this kind of legitimacy in a specific institution which is uh, parliament. Now, I mean, it would be, it would be surprising if, if, uh, if uh, democracy had the same form in all societies. I think it's a mistake, I, I, and, and I'll come back to this later on. I think Indians of my generation held up the Westminster model as the best example of democracy. It's a very good example of democracy. Even now, it is a very good example of democracy. And in a sense, it was natural. It was natural in the aftermath of independence to think of the Westminster model as the model towards which we should all move. Now, my question is that democracy grows over time. Democracy is a learning experience because it's a learning experience. It grows by correcting its own mistakes. And I think the, the problem with holding up one single standard model of democracy is that that model itself doesn't remain fixed for all time. If you look, if you look at the way in which the Westminster model, or the so-called Westminster model has operated, it has not operated in the same way in the last 150 years. There have been massive changes, for instance, uh, between the Houses of Parliament, between the balance of power, between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And then if you look at other countries, like France, for instance, its, it's, 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 it's uh, experience of democracy is very different from the English experience of democracy. Now, in our case, in the Indian case, I think initially, at least, uh, initially, uh, democracy was shaped in the years of the nationalist movement. I think it was shaped in the process of our opposition to colonial rule. And that is why, that is why, and th this was not the case with England. In England, democracy grew on its own and not in opposition to any kind of colonial rule. This is not true in France. In France, French democracy did not grow in opposition, but it's a very significant part of our historical reality, which gave shape to our democracy and which gave it a distinctive shape because there are very distinctive historical conditions under which democracy grew in India. In the United States also, democracy grew in opposition to colonial rule. It was freedom from colonial rule, it was freedom from the crown which led to the growth of democracy in America. So the historical conditions, historical origins of democracy may have some similarities between India and the United States. At the same time, the social matrix in which political institutions have grown in India and will grow in Nepal is very different from the social matrix in which democratic institutions grew in England, France, or Germany. And that has to be kept in mind. 
In India, we have to deal with a large and a very complex society. And some people point out, I was amused to find today, as I was listening to the debate uh, over all the discussions of Obama's victory, I was, I was surprised to find that many people pointed out that uh, the debates and the campaigns have been very bitter and very acrimonious. And they need not have been so bitter and so acrimonious. And many people blamed the bipartisan system in the United States, that they have two parties, and each party is forced to take an intransigent position, a position from which it doesn't want to withdraw. And so it escalates. This animosity between the parties escalates, and this embitters the electoral campaign and the whole electoral system because the Republicans feel that they must oppose, oppose whatever the Democrats put forward and the Democrats feel that they must oppose whatever the Republicans put forward. So they were, uh, they were in fact being critical about the bi-party system, about the bi-party, about the two-party system in the United States. And as an Indian, I couldn't help being amused by this. Because many of us in India feel that the problem with us is that we have neither a two-party system nor a multi-party system, but a system of many parties. Parties, the number runs into three figures, and, 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 and many Indians hope and, and wish that if we could have two parties, then we could settle all our problems. But we can't. The Americans are not settling all their problems, despite the fact that they have a strong two-party system. They're, they're, this, this crea so this is what I wanted to say about democracy. When you think of some political innovation, it settles, it solves certain problems, but it generates new problems of, 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 of by itself. And that is really what makes democracy a learning process. A learning process where you learn from your mistakes and you move forward without ever hoping to arrive at a final point of destination where there won't be any problems anymore. Of course, it's a difficult thing if you are overwhelmed by hundreds of problems at all times. But any political system which turns its back on problems ceases to be a living political system. And I think the advantage of democracy over other political systems is that it does not turn its back on problems even when it is overwhelmed or appears to be overwhelmed by uh, problems. Yeah. Well, the writing of the Constitution of India in the, in some ways, the most successful democracy um, the British democracy doesn't even have a written constitution. Whereas the writing of the Constitution of India in the wake of independence was a turning point in the history of the country. It was in the circumstances natural that many of its elements, many of the elements which entered into our constitution were adopted from the experiences gained during colonial rule. Dr. Ambedkar made no apologies for adopting elements from other constitutions, including the Government of India Act of 1935. He took large parts of the Government of India Act of 1935, which was in fact a creation of colonial rule, into his draft constitution. And many were unhappy with this, because they said that that was uh, a creation of colonial rule. Why are we going back to it? And Dr. Ambedkar's reply, I think, which was a, a great reply, he said, I quote, there is nothing to be ashamed of in borrowing. It involves no plagiarism. It involves no plagiarism. Nobody holds any patent rights to the fundamental ideas of a constitution. So. If you feel that there is something good that you can pick up from the English Constitution or from the American Constitution or the French Constitution, don't adopt it mechanically or blindly. 
try to adapt it to your present needs. And there is nothing wrong in, in, in borrowing because uh, we live in a world where we learn from each other and not just between government and opposition. We learn from other countries, including countries with which we might have had embittered or bitter relationships in the past. In retrospect, it appears natural that India should have adopted the parliamentary system and the Westminster model as the starting point in its journey as a sovereign, independent republic. But that was the starting point. But it hardly needs to be said that the starting point cannot be taken to be the end point. As I have said, our practice has shifted away from the model of constitutional democracy to that of populist democracy, where the rule of com numbers counts for much more than it did when we started off. At the same time, I must repeat this, it has shifted away, but it has not abandoned constitutional principles and procedures. In fact, uh, I think that uh, one of the things that we learned from the emergency, the emergency of 1975-77, was a very bad period for us. But it also taught us some great lessons. And in retrospect, from this distance of time, in some ways I'm glad that it came. Because it taught Indians that democracy was firm and secure in India. Because the very person who imposed the emergency on India felt that this can't continue. And it was she, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who revoked the emergency and came back to the... That is partly because in a sense, constitutionalism and democratic principles had become established in Mrs. Gandhi's bloodstream. Motilal Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi. And she was never, never very comfortable or at ease. And it's not simply that she feared criticism from the Western countries. I think in, 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 in her own mind and conscious, conscience, she found something uh, uncomfortable about ruling a country through an emergency. And so the emergency was withdrawn and uh, to the great credit of the Indian electorate, when the elections were announced, she was defeated. She was defeated in the election of 1977, but to the great credit of Mrs. Gandhi, she stuck it out. She stuck it out and when the elections came again in 1980, she won the elections. So this is the way in which dem democracy has moved forward in India. In the modern world, many different regimes of very diverse kinds claim that they are democracies. Are we obliged to take all these claims at face value? simply because a nation says that we are a democracy, should we accept it? As a de Is there some acid test, some litmus test, which tells us that no matter how flexible our conception of democracy is, uh, we cannot accept this particular regime, even if it claims to be a democracy, we cannot accept the claims of that regime as a democracy. But the appeal of the idea of democracy, of the ideal of democracy is very, very strong. As many regimes, which reject democratic institutions, turn their back on democratic institutions, justify this by saying, this is a temporary measure. This is a temporary, there are exceptional conditions in the country, reasons of security or, or, or reasons of economic development require us to adopt these measures, these uh, extraordinary measures, because we are living in extraordinary times. So people have this feeling that Democracy is something that is valuable in the modern world. Democracy is, is the language of the modern world. Even when people abuse the provisions of democracy, the institutions of democracy, they like to talk about democracy. I've said that... Uh, that uh, um, among political theorists who look at different political systems, the practice is generally to classify different political systems according to 
the forms of government. But I have an idea which I would like to place before you that it might be a better idea to try to classify democracies not in terms of the forms of government but in terms, terms of the forms of opposition. What is the form that the opposition takes in this democracy and what is the form that the opposition takes in the other democracy? That may be a good way of trying to understand what is distinctive of democracies as such and what are the specific characteristics of different democracies. Now, in a way, this task uh, was uh, more or less standardized through the creation of the party system. The party system gave not only an institutional basis to democracy, but it gave a focus to the relationship between government and opposition. The party system did that. And, uh, but the party system itself is not as old as democracy. The party system itself came into existence, the party system in the form in which we know it today, came into existence only in the middle of the 19th century with the conversion of uh, with the emergence of mass democracies with the expansion of the electorate. It became more and more important to have uh, institutions which would mobilize the population for electoral support. So the party system came into existence in the middle of the 19th century. And if you look at the party system, then you will find, and again, this came to me as a great surprise, that the Indian National Congress, which was set up in 1885, is one of the oldest parties in the world. Just 1885. It is older than the Labour Party of Britain. It is older than the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, as it then was. It is older than the Chinese Communist Party. So we have had an experience of working with and through political parties, although we have developed our own kind of party system. We have developed our own kind of party system, partly because our specific historical and social circumstances. Regional parties have become very important in India, in a way in which they could not possibly acquire importance in the United Kingdom, which is a small country with far less diversity than is the case with India. I don't think that it would happen, I don't know, but I don't think this would ordinarily happen in Nepal because it doesn't have the same scale, the same size, either of territory or of population that India has. And it doesn't have, it does have some diversity of population, but not the kind of division on the basis of language, race, caste, and so on, that is characteristic of, of uh, India. So when we look at the way in which party systems have operated and have organized the relationship between government and opposition, we find different kinds of party systems. Among political theorists, the standard classification of party systems was that of the two-party and the multi-party system. United Kingdom and the United States are examples of two-party systems. United States an even better example than the United Kingdom. But they are examples of the two-party system. In England, it's, it's, it's interesting because the United Kingdom, at the end of the 19th century, had two parties, the conservatives and the liberals. In course of time, the liberals gradually dropped out, but the Labour Party filled up the vacuum that was created by the obsolescence of the Liberal Party. So first it was conservatives and liberals, then it became conservatives and Labour. But now, the Liberal Party has come back in a new incarnation called the Liberal Democratic Party. And people in Britain, people in, in Britain worry about the problems of running coalitions. And just imagine the kind of worry that we have about running coalitions. But when one looks at what is happening in the United States today, the president is a Democrat, but the House of Representatives is controlled by the Republicans. Senate, uh, Democrats have a slight majority in the Senate, but it's perfectly possible that the president is a Democrat and both houses of Congress are controlled by the opposite party. Then what happens to legislation? What happens to legislation? So, again, I mean, there is no simple or neat answer which tells us if we only. I've heard so many educated Indians say, 
if we only had a civilized two-party system like Britain or the United States, how much simpler life would have been for Dr. Manmohan Singh <laughs> if we only had a two-party system. But two-party systems create their own problems. But they're, they, they're there, they work, and then you have multi-party systems. Multi-party systems necessarily, or not necessarily, but generally uh, lead to coalition governments. And coalition governments are not always very stable. You have multi-party systems in France, in Germany, in Italy, and, and they, they lead to coalition governments. Coalition governments work well, but they don't always complete their full term of four years or five years in office. So that's, that's a problem. But uh, coalition governments do not necessarily brush under the carpet serious problems while they are in office. In a country like the United States, if the same party uh, holds the White House, as well as both houses of Congress, the problems that are raised by the other party are brushed under the carpet for at least four years. And then they come up and, 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 and confront you when you are least expected them, expecting them to, to confront you. So, but anyway, so the standard classification is two-party system and multi-party system. But India is not really a multi-party system. It's a system of many parties. But there are two other possibilities that I want to consider. That is the possibility of a one-party system. As you have had in many countries, Soviet Union, China, and so on. And if you have a neat and tidy mind, then you would naturally ask, what is a one-party system? A system means that it should have at least two units, otherwise it can't be a system. But you do have a one-party. You have had a one-party system in the Soviet Union, from Stalin right down to Gorbachev, or Lenin right down to Gorbachev, you've had a one-party system in the Soviet Union. And you now have a one-party system in China, which is doing extremely well economically and militarily. Now, is a one, then you would naturally like to ask, uh, wh if, why do we need a party in a one-party system? What kind of a system is it? But if you look at the matter a little closely, you will find that the party has been not just a means of articulating the relationship between government and opposition, it has also been used as a mechanism for maintaining surveillance and control over the pop population. In fact, the party is valued much more in modern one-party systems than in modern two-party or three-party systems. The party had a much greater significance in the political life of the Soviet Union and has now in the political life of China than it ever had in Britain or the United States. In the Soviet Union, certainly, Stalin was neither the president nor the premier. Stalin owed his importance to the fact that he was the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So the party is very important for a variety of reasons. Now in India, we we have parties, we have many parties, and I think they play uh, some part in the state legislatures, and they also play some part in uh, the central legislature, although they also lead to a great deal of chaos, confusion, and disorder in parliament. And some, one sometimes wonders whether, uh, whether uh, they, are, uh, they, are, they are performing a positive, a constructive, or a destructive role. Do we really need parties? The alternative to the one-party system is something which Indians have always dreamt about in their minds. By always, I mean since the time of the nationalist movement. What is the other alternative to the one-party system? The other alternative is party-less democracy, a democracy with it, without parties. That, I think, that idea, as an ideal, it, is no, it has not been realized in practice in India. And I'm happy that it has not been realized as a practice in India. But that remains in the minds of many Indians. And when you see these civil society movements, like the movement by Anna Hazare and the others, you can understand some of their contempt and disdain for all political parties drawing its sustenance from Gandhian ideals.
from Gandhi and ideas. Gandhiji did not believe, Mahatma Gandhi did not believe in party politics. He believed that parties serve only to divide the people. But that's the purpose of democracy. Not just to divide people, but to acknowledge these divisions and to give them some space in the political life. And therefore, we can't go back to the kind of ideal that Gandhiji had in mind, which is a purely communitarian kind of politics. It is a kind of politics that might work in the village community. I don't know whether it did work or did not work in the village community, but that cannot work in a large, modern, rapidly changing society like India. It's impossible. You cannot run the political system without acknowledging that the community itself is divided and this division must be brought out into the open because different members of the community, different sections of society have different and divergent and changing interests. It's no point in brushing all this under the carpet. You must bring it out into the open. So, uh, the idea, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not therefore surprising. Gandhiji's ideal of democracy was the village community. The village community is the place where Members of the village community sit together jointly, harmoniously, and solve all their problems among themselves without involving outsiders. And it's not surprising that the very community that Gandhiji admired was hated by Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar wrote some of his most scathing attacks on the village community in the Constituent Assembly. Because he saw, I think rightly as a sociologist, I think, that the village community under the cloak of consensus and harmony and community simply brushed under the carpet all the different divisions of caste and class that were boiling over in the village. So what do you do with these divisions? You, you, don't, you, don't, uh, you, 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 you don't turn your back on them. It is very, very difficult to face all these. As we in India realize this over and over again, it's very difficult to face all these differences and these conflicting, competing interests and to find a way forward. But that's the only way that is available in a democracy and I think that it's a fantasy to believe that India can be run, a nation of more than one billion people can be run on the principles on which village communities are supposed to have been run in India before the British came or before the Muslims came. Those village communities ran very well except that the upper castes, who were the landowning castes, had a very good time, and the Dalits and the submerged castes uh, who were oppressed, they had a very bad time. I don't think that, that there was any question in those village communities of equal participation of all sections of the community in the decision-making process. So, but the appeal of a kind of consensus, consensual politics a kind of politics which will move forward through social movements, through social movements, that appeal remains in India. That, uh, and that is a possible alternative. I mean, if you want to organize opposition to the government of Mr. Manmohan Singh, you can try to do what Mahatma Gandhi did in trying to organize opposition to the British. He tried to organize opposition to the British by going directly to the people and by developing very powerful social movements. And I think that will continue in India. And at the end of my, but I think that the party system will also continue in India. I think that they will both. So you will have not one single way of articulating opposition in India. You will have more than one way of articulating opposition in India. Through the opposition parties, I don't think that the opposition parties are going to disappear from India because they have a useful role. But I don't think that these social movements are going to disappear from India because they have very strong roots. These very social movements have very strong roots in our nationalist movement. And the political parties also have very strong roots in our nationalist movement. So there are two, two distinct streams of opposition which will coexist in India what will be the outcome of their coexistence, I cannot tell. But I just wanted to put before you some of the ideas which have been in my mind in the last few months, and I hope that you have not found it too tedious. Thank you very much.